uh, Brian Bell, who is going to talk to us about what goes on here, uh, how it is we make this all happen, and all the incredible work and energy that goes into maintaining uh, a greenhouse and growth chamber operation at a plant research or life science research institute. Uh, so Brian, uh, here he is right here. And uh, so tell us a little bit about what goes on here and what kind of the overall strategy of the greenhouse sure. management is. Okay, so um, this is a, a plant research institute which differs greatly from production facilities. Uh, so all these plants uh, may be genetically modified or they may be very weak or back cross for generations with wild species. So they're not your typical tomatoes or typical plants that people would see grown. So that requires a lot of special attention uh, to detail with environments uh, and uh, even uh, nutrients, soils, and plant care in general. So that's how we differ um, from many places. And we do things a little differently. We try to provide the best resources to the plants so that they can thrive, so that we can get the best research for the, um, the scientists. Also, um, many of our researchers work stress um, in plants. So our goal here in the greenhouses is, is to not have any stresses on the plants. And we can talk about some ways that we provide that. Great. Um, we have a small crew, myself and two greenhouse assistants, and we operate 365 days a year. So no the, plants, the plants do not take holidays. <laughs> uh, typical um, greenhouse farmers. Uh, so to start off with, um, I believe in an integrated pest management approach to uh, controlling disease, to creating uh, good environments for our research plants. And the first step in that is, I think, uh, cultural controls, but that starts with a good facility. So we have a nice size room compartment um, for, uh, for the research plants that are easy to control the environments and to do that we have a state-of-the-art uh, greenhouse control system here you can see it's uh, Argus which is differs from a building control in that we have a weather station outside and we it the weather station predicts trends in the weather whether it's getting sunny and it's cold out uh, there's different heat loads and it can prioritize the heating and cooling uh, through that system and we can go in here in our office, and we have a central uh, control system where we can monitor all that data. Monitor that data. Uh, we can adjust the heating and cooling to um, make it the most efficient for energy savings, uh, but also make it the best for each each individual plant. So we have a control system here. We can pop open uh, one of the greenhouses, and it gives us very uh, precise detail on the heating and cooling systems. We have different stages so that we uh, save energy and we don't have big swings in temperature. And then um, we can we can set up climate and, and graphing data of heating and cooling set points along with humidity and how all the systems within the greenhouse um, operate and, and work together uh, for the best efficiency, but also to provide the best environment for the plants. And part of IPM we'll get into is biological control. And so sometimes each plant in the greenhouse will have a pest, a natural enemy, you know, that, that attacks right. it. Well, we use beneficial insects um, to help combat those pest insects. And sometimes we can look at the environment and tweak it a little bit in favor of the beneficial insect and try to reproduce or slow down the reproduction of the, the enemies to the plants. So that's another thing we can do to maximize our control without using uh, chemical pesticides. But um, so this is a great tool um, that we can look back. If we have power outages, we can see how it affected the plants. We can look back for two years and and look at the data in case project leaders or scientists need that data. Um, they, they find something out later on, they need it, we have it here. Um, so this is very much integrated 
with the science and the research. It really is, yeah. and um, it makes it makes a controlling environment so much better. Um, let's also look at our. Accidentally logged out. <laughs> That's okay. Let, we we also have um, a central com control system for our growth chambers, which we have approximately forty uh, conviron growth chambers. So um, we can look at a virtual chamber here, and and it's as if we're right at the growth chamber. And we can program these to, um, we can ramp the temperature, control the humidity very precisely, uh, control the light levels. And that, that is the difference between uh, a growth chamber and a greenhouse. Um, our greenhouses uh, are affected by outside temperatures. Um, mm -hmm. If it's cloudy, they get less light. If it's really cold out, um, there's a lot more heating going on in the greenhouse through the winter. It can be a little less humidity. The chambers, we can very precisely control photo period. We can control temperature to a tenth of a degree, 24 hours a day. Um, so we get very tight control in, in a controlled environment. Um, so if chamber. something goes wrong, do you get... Do you get a call at home? Is there some sort well, of... Well, that's one of the <laughs> benefits of us. Uh, th these uh, growth chambers and greenhouses are alarmed, and they uh, directly dial my, my home phone and my cell phone, and it'll keep dialing it and emailing me until I respond. So, yes. So it could be the middle of the night. Many times. On Thanksgiving. It can be. And, and something fails, you're, you will get a call. Absolutely. And... Um, Sometimes it's as simple as um, a researcher was kind of warm and they saw how to open a back vent, but it got cold at night and then it went off on low temperature alarm. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, I can access these from home and if I find situations like that, I can close the vent from home and go back to bed. But sometimes we have to come in. So some of the, so some of the stuff in the greenhouses you can actually control remotely. That's true, yes. yes. Impressive. Yeah, it's very, uh, very good control systems. What did greenhouse managers do before all this technology? Uh, they had <laughs> pretty simple alarm systems that, um, that. Was it like the volunteer was, fire alarm that would go off in the whole community? Well, actually, I know <laughs> Cornell University um, had a room and they had a student stay there. Oh, and really? they gave them free room and board to be on call for any local alarms. So, wow. but I guess they, it's not. Today, things have changed rules and regulations, but um, it was so, pretty tough in the past. There's a little lesson into the sacrifice that goes into doing discovery research. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, so let's go take a look at the greenhouse. All right, and let's go. And talk a little about um, individual houses. Um, let's just take a look in here, and when we talk about... Um, our systems, we added uh, a shade system, but it also it works as a heat retention system. And let me just uh, operate this. Um, so take a look up here. And on a cloudy day, this system will remain open. But if the intensity is too bright, based on our, our weather station, um, in the day to reduce plant stress and watering needs. Uh, the shade system will close. It's got strips of aluminum to reflect uh, heat back out. And also, the beauty of this is on cold nights, this will close at dusk if the outside temperature is below what the greenhouse environment is. And so it creates an insulating barrier which really saves us energy. So this is an excellent addition to our system. We used to have to climb up in the spring and roll whitewash on, and it was risky. Uh, a lot of bad chemicals used. Uh, there was no control from hour to hour on cloudy days. It was doubly shaded. And so now this can react as the weather changes. And, give and it plants. senses that automatically. It does. We have a light meter on the roof mm -hmm. through the Argus. 
Argus control system, and we can uh, set each individual room to where we want that to close or remain open. If we have plants like maize, where we want a lot higher light levels, uh, we have it close much later. And only on the most intense part of the day will they close and keep the plants from being stressed. Um, the greenhouse effect uh, really does make a difference uh, in the summertime. These units heat up quite rapidly and we need good exhaust systems and good air mixing. So, um, and then this box here is our Argus um, aspirated box. So it's pulling air through at all times and it has dual sensors measuring the temperature so that if one fails and there's a disagreement, we'll get an alarm. So we know that it's accurate and then this can control our heating and cooling on given days. And that really uh, provides for a tighter uh, environment. So, so it's, um, it's pretty neat that you know a lot of the research is hoping to improve sustainability and yeah. then the the, the care of the subject matter is also <laughs> That's right. exercising sustainability. Well, um, one thing about research plants is our, our focus isn't always to save as much energy as possible because we're trying to recreate an environment that plants live in. Whereas if somebody's trying to make money in production, they want to use the minimum amount you know, of energy cost they can. But we want the minimum energy cost and yet, you know, get the results the researchers need. Right. So it's a little different. So we do very much focus on energy savings, though, with, with things that we do here. And, and we actually, um, by um, putting this Argus control system in and changing uh, the uh, heating and cooling a little with valves, uh, with proper valves, we were able to save over 150,000 a year. Wow. So it was a uh, very fast payback yeah. for having a good control system. Not to mention the benefit in research uh, plants. Right. Uh, we have a, a potting room or head house in here, that we call it. Um, we keep supplies available for all the researchers to use. Um, we recycle our pots, which is environmentally friendly and saves us a lot of dollars. Uh, we also hire uh, a handicapped person through Challenge, and it gives them a great way to uh, be out in the community and um, have a job and be able to interact with people and provides a great uh, help to us to take care of our, our pots and some other needs around here. Um, we have a big autoclave here. All the plant material leaving Boyce Thompson Institute, um, we, we don't want to worry about if we're going to put virus or transgenics into the environment, and we want to comply with every regulation, so we autoclave everything in this big autoclave, and that way we're sure that everything leaving here is, um, has been uh, taken care of properly according to our regulations. Um, in this area, we uh, provide all kinds of soil mixes. One interesting thing about plant research is that one day we're growing desert plants. Um, the next day we're growing uh, wild type tomatoes from Peru. Uh, we're growing coffee. We're growing tomatoes, maize, all kinds of species of plants. And each one of them has an ideal soil and pot size. So. Uh, Important part in healthy plants is having those correct uh, soil pot sizes. Uh, we do have our own soil mixer, so we can use different amendments and provide uh, more acidic soils, better soils with better drainage, um, a heavy soil with more clay. We can provide what the researchers or the, the plants need to, to get the healthiest. Uh, so there's a fair amount of detail that goes into this stuff, huh? There is. <laughs> um, the first thing I say we do when we look at each plant we grow is we sit down and do a profile on the plant. What are what is its best environment? What are the soils we need? What kind of pests will it get? So we can research pesticides or biological controls in advance and have everything in place to uh, give that plant the best environment to live in. 
So that's that's um, part of integrated pest management is planning ahead strategies on uh, taking care of these in the best way. Uh, too much fertilizer for a plant is not healthy because it actually increases the life cycle of the pest insect. It provides too much nitrogen, they can reproduce more quickly. Too little and the plant suffers from uh, nutrient deficiencies. So what we want to do is provide the optimum amount and that's what we focus on is providing that care for the researchers. Um, so if anyone thought that the greenhouse managers just get up and hose down the plants and then call it a day, <laughs> you're um, getting quite the education on what it takes. Yes, it's, it's a, it takes a little, a little organization and planning. Um, so here we have some, some coffee plants. So if you're just waking up, <laughs> smell you have the a, coffee. You have a hot cup of coffee, <laughs> you're welcome. BTI doing the coffee research. That's right. Um, this this lab is actually looking at the flowering um, of plants and and fruit ripening and how that uh, how that affects growth. And you have some of the older plants, and you can see uh, coffee beans at different age. These are older ones, but um, we have new plants uh, here ready to take the place of the old ones. And these are just starting to flower. You can see the little flower buds starting. So. And in this same house, when we're talking about technologies, um, we're working a little bit with drip irrigation on these tomatoes. Uh, not necessarily to save time, but to see if we can reduce things like blossom end rot or fruit packing, uh, reduce uh, transmittance of TMV or tobacco mosaic virus by uh, less contact with plants. And we're just working with different uh, technology to try to uh, improve at all times. Um, you see these lights that we have. These are 400 watt high pressure sodium lights. They're a high intensity light. Uh, some people, I know many ask about LEDs. And LEDs, um, there's a lot of research going on. Uh, they're still working on the efficiencies of LEDs in a greenhouse environment, but in certain circumstances they do save energy but we're not quite there yet uh, where we feel we can grow the same research plants uh, at this point. But that is a good technology for the future. So, and if anyone watched the uh, ETI's attempt at the mannequin challenge, you might have noticed Brian's cameo in that video <laughs> that we put out a couple weeks ago. We were ahead of the curve on that. We were, we were out in front of that trend, and the, the tomatoes were eager to show off their ability to maintain stillness. Um, all right, Brian. Uh, maybe we can finish up with some looking at some growth chambers. Sure. Let's take a look down this way. And if there's anything else you want to point out as we walk, yeah. um, I would like to point out that uh, one of the things that's been very successful for us is using natural enemies or beneficial insects to control pests. When I came here, uh, we didn't use those, and I had spray gear on all the time. I was concerned with the health mm -hmm. uh, effects, but also those pesticides do affect the plants. They are a stress. And so with a little research, um, we found out that we could control things like uh, greenhouse white flies on tomatoes and tobacco by releasing these little parasitic wasps called Encarcia formosa. And they do the work for us. No more sprays for 15 years. We haven't sprayed for those. Uh, we have a little colony that we raised here of Aphidius colomani, which is another parasitic wasp that attacks aphids. Aphids are out in the grass every day. When people walk into work, they walk through the grass or they lay in it in the summer. And then they come into the building not thinking that they're carrying these pest insects in the building. So everyone that works here is a danger to you. That, that can be true. <laughs> every time the door is open, we can bring pest insects <laughs> right. in. So we have these available, and they pretty much stopped our problems with green peach aphids. Um, and thrips, many growers know, are a huge pest problem. We use different beneficial insects, like soil-dwelling mites, small mites that feed on the first instar of the thrips, and then uh, an aureus, or a true bug, which attacks all ages of thrips. And by attacking these pest insects at different life stages in a greenhouse, we've been able to get through uh, the crop without having to spray pesticides. 
and it's healthy for us, better uh, for the environment, and better for our researchers. So that's uh, a part of what integrated pest management involves. Uh, at times, we do have to apply pesticides. Uh, powdery mildew is one of the common problems, and we apply fungicides to control that. But again, we In uh, grow chamber, it's uh, 432 square feet, and we can um, provide pretty tight controls. You can see here they're um, doing inoculations with bacteria that uh, will cause uh, the plant to die. Uh, they're looking at different um, uh, pathogens of, of tomato plants here, and we try to keep. All our facilities clean. That is a huge important part of cultural control is reducing the pests and pathogens by keeping uh, the facility uh, disinfected and very clean and orderly. So yeah, this will be one of our, our big walk-ins. And then we have smaller size walk-ins. Uh, here we're uh, raising some Metacago truncatula or uh, uh, a variety of alfalfa, and then we have some leaks in here. But again, uh, very tight controls and uh, very uh, we, uh, another thing we do here is we check watering at a regular time, four times a day. But we only water plants that need water. We don't just go through and water everything, which many people think. Then your small, your weakest plants would die from too much water. And so we treat each plant as if it's the most valuable, precious plant that researcher could have. So we get special care to each plant, which is again, a difference between a research facility. And, and uh, let's finish up over here. I'll show you some breaching chambers. But So on the outside, we uh, keep careful track of the treatments that we give the plants, uh, the environments that is asked for, who's in here, the material. They're misted or watered uh, or fertilized according to the uh, prescribed treatments of the researchers. And we all work together to provide the best research plants. Hard to do research. About the plants, right? That's right. <laughs> so we all work as a team. We have our we have our um, mechanical staff that's backing us up and supporting us by taking care of the equipment, and we have our IT department that's helping us out with programming at times when we need it or things like that. And we all work together. Yeah. That's great. Well, Brian, uh, let's zoom out here. Thank you so much for. Um, taking us on this little tour of the greenhouses and the growth chambers as part of our Giving Tuesday live programming uh, throughout the day here at BTI. We'll be jumping into all the different areas of our facilities, giving you an up-close look at various research and the people doing that research. Uh, it's Giving Tuesday, National Day of Philanthropy. Uh, we're trying to give a little something back to all the people that support us by giving you an up-close look everything happening here at BTI and giving you a face with uh, all the work that you support. Uh, if you want to support our current campaign, we're not going to tell you not to. Um, and you can see that um, uh, on our Facebook page. And uh, you probably received an email about it too. So uh, check it out and uh, we'll see you back online here at about 1030, where we'll do a little roaming of the hallways here at BTI and see what fun things we can stumble upon. We'll see you in a half hour. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Brian, how long have you been here at BTI? I've uh, been here almost 30 years now. Almost 30 years. Good part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good chunk of time. But well, we thank you for your service, Brian. You thank do amazing you. work. And I think Appreciate everyone it. that watches is much more impressed now with 
greenhouse management at a research institute than they were before. So thanks again to Brian's three decades. Thank See you. you soon.